Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the BPHL um, Innovation Fest Save Our Stages panel. And I am joined by Meg Bassett from Warehouse on Watts. We have Hal Real from World Cafe Live. Um, Gerald Veasley is with us from multiple organizations, including Jazz Philadelphia and South uh, Jazz Club. And we have Brad Grossman from Helium. Um, which is a national uh, chain, chain of, uh, of uh, clubs. My name is Heather Blakesley. I'm the executive director of Jazz Philadelphia. And what we are going to talk about today is the fact that in Philadelphia, as in um, all states and cities around the world right now, our stages are dark for the most part. And we're gonna to talk today a little bit about what that means from an economic standpoint, what it means from a cultural standpoint, and what some of the local players here today are doing both at the local, regional, um, and ultimately national level to try to save our stages, which are a huge part of our economy. Um, a couple of points that I wanna make up at the beginning as context um, that we will get into a little bit more as we go is that, the business model was already um, precarious and a, and a little slim for many venues of all kinds, whether it was large um, arts and culture institutions or small indie venues, which is what we're gonna focus on today. Um, changing guidelines have really made it difficult for people to understand what they are supposed to prepare for as a venue, what uh, safety guidelines are. Those have been going back and forth and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But I think ultimately what we're trying to do here is make the case that the arts and culture and entertainment sector are a huge part of our economy, a huge part of our culture, and who we are um, as cities really depends on the strength of this industry. Um, so I'm going to uh, start just going down the list of our, our panelists here, and I'm gonna start with my colleague, Gerald from Jazz Philadelphia. Um, Gerald is a internationally renowned bassist. He is also an entrepreneurial educator and he books um, at least one night, if not more, or did before the pandemic started at South Jazz Club. So he's also a promoter and is familiar um, with what's going on at that level. So. Um, Gerald, I want to kind of have you talk a little bit about the people aspect a little bit, uh, you know, who, who is working in these venues, what is the cascading effect of not just having musicians on stages, but all of the other people that support them, um, and what does it mean, you know, to save our stages when it comes to a, a venue like South? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of times there's a misunderstanding that the folks you see on the stage are the only folks who are impacted by what we're experiencing by COVID in a venue. Right, the fact that the stage is silent and that the room is dark, it impacts a lot of people. And as you mentioned, there's a cascading effect. Um, so I've been curating music at South for almost five years. I have a history of maybe 40 plus years of performing. And what excited me when we first started was the opportunity to see some of my colleagues get an opportunity to perform in a place like Philadelphia. Of course, you know we are ideally located between Washington DC and New York. So it's a great routing opportunity for artists. And my particular series happened typically midweek, but would uh, go into the weekend as well. And over that time, we curated about 250 events and employed dozens of artists, both nationally and uh, locally. And I would typically put um, checks into the pockets of musicians to the tune of about $300,000, $350,000 a year. So no checks were written since March. So that's one of the things that hurts me really deeply because the people that you uh, that we present, they're not superstars. And often when people think about the music industry, they think about the, uh, the people who are at the top of the food chain. But you have folks like me who are just striving to either be or stay in the middle class and as you said, it's not just the ecosystem of musicians, but all the people who support our work, technicians who are working the board, people who are doing the lighting, people who are helping to load in, folks who actually rent equipment to the venues. Um, and when you talk about restaurants, as I'm sure Hal will talk about later, you have folks that uh, scores of people who help that engine work, who are in the kitchen, who are serving us, and so many people who are now at a, at a standstill. And so it's on a personal level uh, for me, um, having lost the income and the revenue that I would have generated from about 65 performances that we would have put on, uh, it doesn't just hurt me as an individual, 
and not just professionally, but all the folks who I, I won't be able to um, help them make sure they have income to support themselves and their families. Right. And, and Joe, can you talk a little bit too about, um, you know, the size of the room at South and the kinds of restrictions that you think are in, are in place right now for them to be able and what to, to perform and whether that's working? And I know you've also done a few live streams, so I wonder what that's like for you as a musician as well. Yeah. So at Philadelphia right now for uh, an in-person event like the ones that we would typically curate, you can have a 25 percent capacity. Um, for us, our break even was always 70%. So the math is not in our favor. It just, I don't even know how we could move forward to present music. Uh, it would take a, a tremendous support. This is again something that I'm sure Hal will touch on later. In terms of the live streaming opportunities, I think the, the, the plus about live streaming is that it shows the innovative uh, spirit. Of, of not just the music industry, but all sorts of industries that, is, that have now pivoted to this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's not a business model that's sustainable. Number one, there is a glut of things to watch. You can't control the quality. You don't know, uh, even as a fan of the music, I can't even keep up with what's available. And then we haven't figured out a way, an equitable way for people to get paid by these performances. Mm -hmm. I recently had, an, on a personal note, I recently had an experience where a presenter um, offered me an, a live streaming opportunity, which will, it will be my first and I'll do it. Um, it's actually for um, a, a presenter in Pittsburgh. Shout out to Janice Burley Wilson. Mm -hmm. But one of the concerns that she had in booking her series was that there will be artists now who are overexposed. So now the, the problem that we had in the real world where is supply and demand. If you oversupply uh, an inexpensive, uh, I hate to word, use the word product, but inexpensive product, then it's hard to charge for that later. And so we're seeing now as, as much as there was a, a need for us to perform virtually and a desire for people to have us perform, now we have to educate people that there's a monetary value and, that you, and that's gonna be a tough proposition. Right. Um, thanks for that, Gerald. And I, I should say, if there are any musicians in the room or people who are presenters, um, business model challenges and um, innovations there are something that we'll be talking about at the Jazz Philadelphia Summit, October 9th and, and 10th. So I want to make sure that you guys know there'll be some resources there as well. Um, Meg, I'd like to move on to um, you and to Warehouse on Watts. Um, you guys are working, I believe, in multiple genres there, and you've already begun pivoting a bit on programming and feel like you may have some lessons learned and things to offer in terms of what it's like for you and what's working and what's not. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, we've tried on a couple different hats since we closed our doors. Essentially, our last show was, I believe, March 8th or 9th. It was a Sunday. It was an amazing show, but it felt like something ominous was in the room. We were just like, oh man, we're looking towards not really having anything in the future, like approaching that. Um, the warehouse is unique in that it is a warehouse and we have two large medium sized floors um, of event space. So we thought, well, the first floor we have, you know, a kitchen, we can use that as a commissary kitchen, kind of capitalize on still putting out product for um, people to keep, to order from to keep the warehouse on the map. Um, also, we partnered initially with Faber um, Liquors, so we were able to become the distributing um, factor in distributing their liquor throughout like Philadelphia when no one was able to do anything. When the PLCB shut everything down, no one was doing anything, and that was just like a huge come up, if you will to keep our bartenders, if they felt comfortable with it, wearing masks, wearing gloves, like distributing those things. And also their uh, distilling um, services are about an hour away. So you're just like, let's be the middleman for a little bit. So suddenly the warehouse, like going from doing um, crazy cool underground shows in all different kind of genres, we were just like, well, we're just distributing liquor and food now. Um, mm -hmm. And that lasted for a little bit until, Faber um, switched over to hand sanitizing pr uh, production only. And then it was another pivot. We partnered with Boardroom Spirits. Um, we did that. And then that since has dried up since, you know, everyone is dining outside. People can go back out. People have obviously like 
it's starting to reopen. So it was good for when it lasted to keep certain people employed. But as like things are subtly reopening, the jobs kind of are running away from our small venue to other venues that can re or other markets that can reopen. So those opportunities where they were once really advantageous are drying up. So our employees have been dropping off, like just the ability to sustain staff, the ability to, you know, sustain that kind of a market that just enabled us to keep the doors open. They're still open, but um, not to the public, obviously, but yeah. So meanwhile, on the top floor, um, we have a recording studio, Watts Studio. Um, one of the owners in that, there are four parts of that, uh, Justin Schleep and myself and our friend, Rob Coble, who does like production management. Um, we're just brainstorming, you know, what are we gonna do with the top floor? We can turn it into say uh, like a production studio. So I ordered some key green paint. I painted the entire back wall and floor, bright green, got some lights. Um, good cameras, everything. So we've been um, functioning as essentially like a broadcasting studio from the top floor and doing what we can on the bottom floor. Um, uh, we started a channel called Wow TV just to enable like the local DJs and bands to still practice their art and um, music and put it forth. It's crazy when someone comes in for the first time and it's, just myself a, or Justin or Rob and a visual artist um, doing animations behind them on the green screen. Um, and one of us will run the sound, um, but it's just bare bones in there. But when some of these artists come in, it's overwhelming how cathartic the experience is. They're like, I haven't done this. I don't have the, you know, not everyone has the privilege to have like CDJs and a mixer or turntables and a mixer at home. They don't have that. So like being able to practice your craft still. So that's been a labor of love. It's not bringing in any money like Gerald already spoke about. It's not really monetizable. It's just because it makes us feel normal and other people come in and feel normal and safe. So we are um, working on expanding that idea into actually um, having a full on production studio, We're creating an editing room for post editing. We are, We've shot some videos, some original content. They're actually at the warehouse right now recording comedy sketches. Um, and that's kind of why I was intrigued about what Brad does with Helium. Um, so, I mean, we're just trying to make it work, but that's what the warehouse looks like these days. <laughs> so Meg, you mentioned a couple of, of times, and I think, you know, I saw people nodding along to this, that you're trying to make people feel normal and you're trying to make them feel safe. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably something that everybody is kind of going through right now. When you first started trying to think about opening up, what was the conversation around safety protocol for your employees and for people that might be coming to the venue? Yeah, so if anyone is going, like if a DJ said they want to bring a partner or a friend, um, it has to be known beforehand. Um, everyone has to wear masks. We wipe down the equipment in between, and it's several feet in between where our production um, equipment sits. And the DJs are, or live bands are performing and we're taping it. Um, and there's no one, like, at any given time, I think there's been more than nine or 10 people in the room and it's a huge, the upstairs is a big room. So people, I have couches like spattered around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really bare bones. It's strange when people come in first, their thought is I've never been in here when the lights are on. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. And then how vacuumous it feels. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I still turn on the disco balls, turn the lights down and try to create like, some kind of yeah normalcy but oh i love that in this group a disco ball is normal that's my favorite part of this conversation it's more than normal this is the <laughs> one behind me right now. Um, and we you know we were all talking um before the audience joined us and kind of you know making some jokes a little bit about all of this but we were laughing and it was good to laugh and so i'm going to turn it over to brad grossman from helium comedy club now to tell me what it is like for them and one of the reasons that um, brad is slotted in here into the slot is that helium has um uh, operations across the the country um, that he's dealing with and that they all have different 
regulations and rules that they're dealing with. They have audiences that may have either less or more of an inclination to come back when the venues are open. So Brad, I want to kind of open it up to you to tell us what this has been like from a regional and national level and what you're looking at. Thank you, Heather. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. what every day is. And Megan, or Meg, excuse me, um, just real quick, I think what you are doing, uh, having people in your space uh, to perform and test it out, that's awesome. Um, we've been trying to figure out ways to do that. So uh, congratulations to you for, for stepping up to the plate and helping locals. Um, for us, it's it's been a trip. Hopefully everyone can see me right now. I know uh, Zoom connections and all that happy stuff are tough. Um, the regulations have been tough. That's been one of our biggest challenges. We're in uh, seven different states across the country. And every governor and every mayor and every council person has a different idea about what uh, should be happening. So that's been our toughest challenge is really trying to figure out what the rules are. Um, it has been extremely tough uh, to open up. It's been tough to book acts. Um, as we all open up, we're working with agents and managers who want to book something. And then the week of the show, they cancel. And then you have to find someone to replace it. And you have six people in the audience, like the first day we all opened. Um, so it's it's been it's been really tricky. And um, uh, Heather, you, you pointed to different markets and the feeling for different culturals. It's or cultures, excuse me. It's it's pretty interesting. Every city kind of has their own comfort level, and it's not tied to the number of cases that were in their city. Um, you could point to Oregon, where there are very few cases. Um, but a lot of people are just not interested in leaving their homes yet. Um, so it's, it's a guessing game. It really is. And, um, that's, that's the game we all play, right? We love the arts. I love music. I love comedy. And, um, I just want to see it live again. You know, I just want to see it in all of our spaces and, and I'm excited for 2022. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Thank it's you, a good, note, good note to freeze on. Yeah. <laughs> Heather, you're Am muted. Back. Am I back? You're back. You are. <laughs> uh, man. Heather, you're on mute. That's too perfect. I didn't, I didn't want you guys to hear my cat coming in the door. Too that was perfect. Fine. So, um, uh, Brad, I, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about um, just business models in general. This is not an easy industry um, to begin with. Um, and there were challenges certainly before the, the pandemic. So how, how does that square with the new regulations that you're dealing with now? I think we may have just lost Brad again. That's okay. Um, well, while we wait for Brad to come back, um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll circle back to him and how we'll move on to you. Um, you and World Cafe Live are obviously a really beloved part of the Philadelphia uh, and regional um, music landscape. Um, you've recently just switched over to a nonprofit uh, model. Um, but one of the things that you did, knowing how much this is part of our culture and our community here in Philadelphia, is start working at the national level to really start bringing people together. So talk talk about World Cafe Live and how things are going for you, but I also want to hear about what you're doing to build advocacy um, momentum there and what people can do to join in with that. Sure. Thanks, Heather, and thanks to BPHL for allowing this panel and for allowing me to sit here and um, Apologies in advance if I'm the Grim Reaper or Debbie Downer for anybody, but although we're smiling and we remain um, stubbornly optimistic, it's a, a very existential threat to the independent venue ecosystem that's a big part of the music and comedy and live performance ecosystem in the U.S. Uh, I'll start with the micro and say when I left World Cafe Live on March 13th and um, gave my nephew and his lady a hug, uh, they were upstairs catching Trace Bundy, a great guitarist, in a smaller venue. Uh, as I started to, to leave that venue and head to the door, I sort of stopped for a second and thought, wow, I know we're not going to be open tomorrow. And I had thought maybe for a few weeks, but it struck me at that moment, what if I'm wrong? How long is it going to be till we hear music in this wonderful building that we share with everybody? 
And, you know, little, somebody recently asked me, what would you have done differently? And, and hindsight is 2020. If we had known on March 13th that we needed to think about going into deep hibernation, not just for two weeks, then we thought in terms of a month, then we thought two more months, everybody's nodding their head, we all went through this. And then, you know, come August, we said, this is at least three year end. Um, we quickly raised money to support our staff. We started an emergency relief fund immediately because we knew they would need to sign up for unemployment. We furloughed, you know, 80 to 90 salaried and part-time staff members. And um, thankfully our fans were incredible. It was really heartwarming. Uh, they really rose to the occasion, a very grassroots campaign, $10 here, $20 there. And we raised over $60,000 to support our staff during that time period before the unemployment checks kicked in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was heartwarming, but it became darker and darker as to what was going on. Uh, in the bigger picture beyond World Cafe Live, for about 10 years, I have talked to different people in the industry around the country and among my colleagues and said, you know, this is the, I've been involved in various businesses over my career. I'm really old. I'm going to be 95, I think. <laughs> and, uh, and this was the only industry that didn't have a collective voice, didn't have a trade association or any kind of an organization. And when I say this, I mean the independent venue industry. And I should define that quickly and say, what we mean by independent is we're not publicly held corporations. We're not multinational. For the most part, um, independent venues are locally owned, locally operated, making the decisions there, trying to do it all like Meg, we do the culinary, we do the ticketing, we do the booking, we do the production, we do it all. And we're part of our local community and that's very important to all of us. Um, that's different than being, you know, a venue that's one of a thousand venues owned by a big company. And every town, village and city in America has their independent venues. Some of them are iconic, like First Avenue in Minneapolis where Prince got started. And, you know, World Cafe Live aspires to be iconic one day. We've been around 15 years now. Um, and we'll see if we're still around in a year. So there was no collective voice. And um, in February, uh, several of us said, this summer, let's get together in Philly and talk about how we can put together some sort of a national collective coalition to raise our voice and to share best practices and to help us all. And the only reason there was no national voice, as you've heard from Meg, Gerald, and Brad, it's a very tough business. And it wasn't because we didn't like each other or we saw ourselves as competitors. It's because you work so hard every day just to keep your lights on. Nobody had the time and resources. So when we became a nonprofit in December, part of my commitment to the folks who agreed to help us convert to become a nonprofit and help fund that was that I was gonna make the time personally to provide the leadership and we were gonna put some resources behind organizing nationally. And like I said, we thought that would happen this summer. Then COVID hit March 15th. A week later, we had a, before we all said Zoom, we had a, a conference call, remember those? And we had about 70 people on the call. And a week later, we had about 150 people on the call. And a week later, the first week in April, I incorporated uh, the National Independent Venue Association as a Pennsylvania nonprofit. We go by NEVA. Fast forwarding from six months ago, we have 2,800 members in all 50 states. Good job. A major yeah. lobbying, and, and believe me, I'm not talking about me. It's a founding board of five of us and a tremendous village of people who volunteered so much time, various committees, all working really hard, especially at lobbying which in February, if you had said to us, well, if you form this trade association, you know, is it a C3 charitable organization doing great things in the community or are you lobbying Congress? We would have said, what would we be lobbying Congress about? Mm -hmm. But this all changed it. And so we have three bills pending. Um, the one that many of you may have heard of, and this is the beginning of my mo and the end of my modeling career. <laughs> all right. Well done. So, ending in Congress, supported by 63, I just learned, 
I'm sorry, 43 senators have signed on to co-sponsor the Save Our Stages Act, and about 100 members of the House have signed on, both parties from all over the country. Uh, it's a $10 billion bill tailored relief specifically for the independent venues in the country, as well as Broadway theaters, performing arts centers, and other theaters, live performance spaces around the country. Uh, we were the first to close. We will be the last to open. The reason I made my comment about being Debbie Downer is my personal philosophy, and it's shared by a lot of the NEVA members, is until there's either a rapid, and I mean two-minute reliable test, and for example, there are people working on a breathalyzer test. So you would walk in to Meg's place and you'd breathe into a tube and she'd put the tube in a machine and it would say negative, take your mask off, come on in and party. It would say positive, go home, see your doctor. You tested mm -hmm. positive. Or a widely accepted vaccine that's distributed, effective, and has the public's confidence. But without a scientific solution, we while we all cling to grains of sand, you've heard about the drive-in shows, we do some virtual, which no offense, I mean, it's better than nothing, but to me, it's like seeing pictures of food. I want to feel Gerald's base in the room. Yeah. I want to be standing next to Brad, not with a mask and six feet away. Mm -hmm. We want to be there boogieing to what Gerald's playing. Right. Until that happens, these are all grains of sand and we need a beach. And right now that beach needs to come at the federal, state, or local level. So the cities don't have money. Philadelphia had to knock out their, their cabinet level arts and culture division, had to take funding away from the cultural funding program. Mm -hmm. um, Philadelphia is not the only city like that, but it's regrettable. And Philly's struggling because I know how much we pay in taxes and Brad usually pays in taxes and they put, we're not paying the liquor tax. We're not selling any booze. We're not paying the amusement tax. We're not selling any tickets. Right. Multiply that towards all those businesses and all the sales tax. We understand the city's not in a position to do much for economic development today. And, and how hope, could you talk a little a bit also about what's in that bill? Like, what are you guys asking for that you think people need to know? Like, if there's if there's another legislator on the call right now, what do they need to know about the particular business model that we have that others don't that, that needs great, to be addressed? Great question, Heather. The first thing they need to know is that that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says that 86 percent of businesses have reopened completely or partially throughout the country. Well, we are, for the most part, part of that 14% that has not reopened. Some of us, like Meg said, World Cafe Live does curbside pickup on Saturday night. That's not to make money. That's to keep the pilot light on and keep the brand alive. We do some virtual things. Again, it's the same reason. So you can't talk about us opening from an economic model at 50% or even 75% because our rent's not going to be 50%. Our ta real estate taxes aren't going to be 50%. Our insurance, our fixed costs aren't going to change. And it's a model that barely works at 100%. So it's not feasible when somebody says you need to open at 25 or 50%. And one point of clarification about Philadelphia, right now, restaurants can be open at 25% capacity. Mm -hmm. Performing arts venues cannot. They are allowed to have 25 people whether it's the Man Music Center with a capacity of like 15,000 mm -hmm. or it's the small room at World Cafe Live with a capacity of 200, you can have 25 people. And you are not allowed to serve them food or beverage. So totally not feasible for performing arts venues to open under those circumstances. And understand something. Most of us don't want to open. We understand there's the public health is, is a driving force and it's very important. But because of that, we simply cannot reopen our businesses. So that's what we want the legislature to understand. Why are we different? Why is this small business different than other mom and pop businesses? It's because there is no path for us that's foreseeable in the future to open. And we just want to be able to keep the pilot light lit so that when there's a scientific solution, we can reopen, welcome the public back, we're all about bringing the public together, the antithesis of what's going on right now.
So we say, don't kid ourselves. It, 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 this is what it is. And so we need that help. In terms of the legislation, the PPP was an amazingly bold, quick act by Congress, but it was aimed at helping businesses hire their employees back. But we can't hire employees back for work that's not there. Um, so these acts, the Restart Act we support, and the SOS Act, which is a mini version of Restart for our segment, the difference from the PPP, what they offer is more money because that we're looking at a much longer time frame. They offer the ability to use that money for more purposes. The PPP was only for payroll, rent, or utilities. We have lots of other costs, including debt service. And more lenient forgiveness provisions because none of us can take on debt when you've got a business that has zero revenue. And that's the thing we want legislators and the public to understand. We have all basically had zero revenue since March 13th. So people say, so how far off is your revenue compared to a year ago? 100%, it's actually worse than that. It's 110% because we all have outstanding obligations for tickets that were sold, for shows that aren't going to happen, that we're liable for refunds. Those of us who do events, social technology, hosting panels like this, have event deposits to give now. So it is, a crisis that if we don't get a lifeline from the feds, the state, or the locals, some combination, within these next 30 to 60 days, you're going to see major closings. And we're already seeing closings in and around Philadelphia and across the country. Yeah, and I think I saw you guys did a survey of um, the Neva constituency, and it was a hugely high number. Tell me what the number was of people who don't think they'll make it. 90% of our members say they will not make it to year end. Um, and we've seen go from a venue a week in the country announcing they're not going to reopen to now about a venue a day. Yeah. And um, Brad, I know we lost you a little bit earlier, and I want to bring you back into the conversation here. Um, yeah. You were talking about business models and what it's like in, in different places in the country sure. as, as you're trying to open up. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. And uh, I apologize if I if I get lost again, um, just to and I want to get to you, Heather, just to comment on how I, the biggest picture is not only are these businesses, which are important to our ecosystem of just business in general, but culturally, if our business don't exist, then up and comers and local musicians and comics will no longer exist. They will no longer have stages to play on. I know as Helium has grown, and that's why we're opening smaller rooms to make sure that locals have acts, or we open up Monday and Tuesday to make sure that, but I know everyone on this call has up and comers. Once you get rid of these small... I think we lost them. Okay, we lost Virtual. Them. <laughs> yeah. um, I can... Well, there, I, obviously, you know, you know where he's go, where he's going with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Am I back? Um, yeah. Yep. I think we all know where I'm going, which is once the little guys are gone, that's it. Maybe ticket prices go up. Artists get paid less by the big folks. The economics of it, there's no competition once everybody's wiped out. And I, not to be, I'm not trying to say, hey, independents are going to be extinct, but it's it, it is getting there. So. Sorry to answer on, uh, I just wanted to add on to Hal's point because I think it's very important to know how important um, this act is and, and where we're at. Um, Heather, just to speak to different locations around the country, um, it's just odd, you know? You could have, Oregon has close, very low numbers, but everyone is afraid to go out. Um, so culturally, people aren't necessarily as excited to go out in different parts of the country. And that's the only point I wanted to make is that it is very tough as an operator and a booker to figure all of this out while trying to generate revenue to pay for everything that Hal's been speaking about. Um, Heather, so yeah, I, before I, I go want, offline again. Yeah, Hal, go ahead. I want to say that there's the, the silver lining here, if you can call it such, is that Neva would never have come about. And there's when, when we get to the other side of this, there's so much wonderful work we all look forward to doing together. And also cities have organized now, so Philadelphia, um, with a, a great shout out to my colleague, Kerry Park at World Cafe Live and Brad and others, um, has, has an organization uh, coalition called Pivot, Philadelphia Independent Venues Organizing Together. 
And, um, you know, there are 25 or more independent venues from, you know, South Jazz Room and Chris's Jazz Cafe to Union Transfer and Warehouse on Watts and Helium that, um, again, while, yeah, we may have thought we were competitors, sometimes we fight over an artist, but we are this ecosystem. And a study out of Chicago says that for every dollar we generate, $12 is generated locally. So when you think about it, when you come to a show at Helium, there, you're going out to a bar before or after or a restaurant. You're taking an Uber or a taxi. You might be staying in a hotel room. So there, it's not just the cultural aspect that we're talking about. There is a very serious economic impact. Nationally, a study we showed says the tickets that have been lost, the ticket sales from March in this hit through year end are in excess of $10 billion, just the tickets. And if you say $12 is generated by every dollar of those tickets, that's $120 billion. Yeah, and you never get that back. No, that's right. You never get that back, right. Um, so I think I, I want to um, I want to ask Brad and, and Meg actually if you could weigh in um, on the pivot progress and program and kind of what you're doing locally to get together and how that what does that look like on the ground for you and maybe Meg you could start first. Um, in terms of being involved in it, it's you know sitting in on meetings and I mean at best right now what we're doing is trying to have ears and it's kind of like a think tank in a way like what have you heard what have you heard what are you doing right now what are you doing right now everybody's just in limbo um as to what we actually can do um but being committed to being involved and you know when the time comes to actually put the um energy that we are creating right now into practice will be the most important part of it. Um, it's hard to understand or see something like it's hard to, to see what this will be. Um, if we're all right now, just very focused on our independent venues and keeping the doors open. I feel like insular in a way, but also more involved um, in a larger conversation, but also just like, you know, the day to day is okay, we're going in and I'm still, you know, opening the doors, not seeing any uh, revenue or anything and just keeping it going. Um, sometimes it seems like just because and other times it's like, no, it's because we want to be part of the larger community and voice again in a more cohesive manner when and if this does, if we do survive, first of all, and when we can have a better community um, going forward. I think it's a lot of, you know, I, in my head, I'm just like willing hands and it's a labor of love to commit to keep this and put it and invest in my time and energy and our time and energy into Neva and everything. It's necessary. It's been necessary. Um, and we hope that in the future when this does have like, somehow subside that we are more prepared and more we're resilient and prepared and we're better friends <laughs> um so that we can tackle you know this might this is probably the worst of the worst i hope um that we'll ever see but you know if we have the proper lobbying and channels behind us in the future we can pull on what we've learned from this together as a unit and it won't be as you know, it wasn't reactionary, but it became reactionary suddenly um, because it, it was put to, like the impetus for it was already evolving before doors were shut, but it just became immediately like, oh, I was gonna say a different word, but oh crap, like we didn't open, <laughs> we didn't do this first. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Brad, do you have anything you wanna add to that? Uh, I'm excited for Pivot. I think we're all excited just to have, um, to be able to share the experience of one another and brainstorm as Meg was discussing, because Philadelphia is kind of, everybody was kind of waiting to see if something was gonna happen. And then cultural dollars kind of got uh, eliminated and now we're like, oh, okay. Um, Philadelphia has other needs that they need to fulfill. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Um, yeah. And um, 
I don't know. I think we're, we're really starting from a, a little seedling to see what we can do together. I'm excited about it. Uh, we're starting on the messaging and just making sure that our voice is heard just to make sure that people know this is, it's a real problem. Like Hal said, most of the economy is back to work. I know we have a lot of friends and a lot of industries that are doing just fine. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, uh, just getting together and making sure the voice is heard. So people are aware because their favorite things that they love to do outside of work are just not available right now. And they might not be in the future. So, um, the the pivot resources along with Neva and save our stages. Do we do that? Um, no, but we can certainly put them in the chat for sure. One more time. Yeah, we can put them in the chat. Um, yeah. Um, so, Gerald, I'm going to pick on you for a minute right now and ask you a somewhat um, jazz Philadelphia related question that was sparked by what Meg just said, which is that they were organizing before the pandemic happened. And then when the pandemic happened, they were glad that they had that organizing structure in place. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the um, the immediacy of need of, of infrastructure networks and communication networks to bring artists and artistic organizations together and the role of, of leadership like Hal has been demonstrating at the national level um, to be able to keep everyone together and just share information, best practices and resources. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the the genesis of Jazz for the last year was uh, the study that was conducted about three years ago, which kind of mapped out what were some of the issues that Jazz community had and what was some what resources that we were lacking. And they put together this leadership team and you and I came on board as, as staff. And the first thing that we embarked on was this collective impact work, which means en- encouraging folks to get out of their silos and having uh, meetings to determine what's the best common agenda that we could come up with. And it's comprised of music educators, of presenters, of uh, singers and, and musicians, as well as media folks with a couple goals. One is to see are there some of these problems that we can solve uh, on sc- at scale, and to also see is there a way that we can uplift the jazz community in Philadelphia and then um, uh, celebrate it around the world to let folks know how important a community is and, and just uh, what an amazing art form it is as it's played in Philadelphia, great history that we've had. And in doing that work, we never knew that there would be this other application lurking in the background, which mean, which is that when we brought folks together to kind of help uplift the scene, we didn't realize that when COVID hit, that, that community and that those relationships and the communication and that infrastructure that we put together will be utilized to enable us to then provide resources and, 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 uh, and support and also webinars to give people practical information. So it's enabled us to also help us more closely define or more accurately define our work. So Jazz Philadelphia is the best way to think of it is as a service organization, but often that's a little bit squishy, right? Because we don't put on the big show, you know, but we support the folks that do. And so if there's a silver lining, it's that now people understand our work and that we're able to serve in this whole other way in terms of just providing support to a community that really badly needs it. I mean, um, it's been very, very um, exciting to be able to do that, or or I should say rewarding. And then the extension of that is our annual Jazz Summit, which in normal times we do in person. And it would be a conference where people come together and we learn best practices and we kind of connect and hopefully deepen relationships. But this is an all hands on deck moment. So this uh, this year's um, summit will be all about, I love the word pivot. It will be about how do you pivot personally? How do you pivot professionally? How do you pivot as a, as a, as a presenter? What kind of new skills do you need to develop quickly as an educator or as a performer? Um, you were in this emergent crisis situation. And like Hal just said, you know, meanwhile, the bills keep coming. So we have these kind of bread and butter issues that our community faces. But meanwhile, we have these this kind of these social justice, not to take it off, off topic, but meanwhile, we're all struggling emotionally, mentally, spiritually. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with uh, inhumanity, you know, that's right in front of us? And then on top of all of that, we're trying to figure out how do we deal with the emotions that come from the possibility of being sick or losing a loved one. And so there are all these issues that 
we're going to delve into during the summit, which are not just about replacing income, which is huge, but mm -hmm. dealing with these other kind of jugular issues about what it means to be an artistic person in a time of great turmoil. Right. So th thank you for, for sharing that. And I, I wanted to kind of get that out there because it's definitely occurred to me as we've been doing the work that any group of people who organize this together um, is a leadership council. And sometimes you don't know what you're going to be called on to do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Also want to tap into something that um, I think everyone has mentioned in their own way, which is we can't emphasize enough the value of what we're talking about when we're talking about save our stages. You know, unfortunately, it's the kind of thing that we hope we don't experience that experience this, but people won't they won't really appreciate how much it means to their lives until it's not there. Right. So, so we I want to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I want I want to get to a couple of audience questions. And if you if you have questions, um, I'd like to make sure that you put them in the Q and A. I have a couple in there that I'm going to throw out to the group, um, and some of them have to do. Um, many of them have to do with what the long term impacts on the industry are. Um, you know, for instance, one of the questions is: Are we going to see hybrid events where we'll continue to have um, some broadcast? portion of it, but still a live event that other people may be able to attend. Um, I know as a board member at the Philadelphia Folk Song Society who just did a, a large uh, online festival that that's definitely something that they have thought about is that their audience is getting older, the festival grounds are a little challenging. This might be a way to keep people engaged and to actually have audiences all around the world. So. A couple of you have talked uh, tentatively about silver linings. Are there ways in which this is going to change the industry, obviously, for the long term in good ways. And you know, for the people who are, are still around, are there different um, strategies that you think we'll continue to avail ourselves on from you know, broadcasting live events to collaborations that we might not have thought were possible to understanding that if we have a collective voice, we are more powerful as an industry or as a community if we're organizing together. So um, maybe just raise your hand if you have a, a if you want to tackle that question. Meg? I would say um, I, I'm going to start it from a personal and then take it to a venue level. Um, personally, there's silver linings in so far as when you are an independent venue and you are operating without a huge funnel of money, like already granted to you. And it's, you know, it's a lot of sweat equity that goes into producing shows. I'm the general manager at warehouse on lots, but I'm also the booking manager. And it doesn't mean that I am the, ultimate promoter. I work with a lot of different promoters, but I am often trying to fill in those little gaps with local community content, everything like that. So um, silver lining back to that is, you know, it, I needed a break and I'm sure a lot of us were exhausted and have been exhausted. And I know that our staff, like our staff and just a lot of facets of it are, are exhausting, but they're huge rewards on the other side. But the actual pause that it granted me, um, even if it was an oh shit pause, like it was a necessary kind of pause to reflect on like, okay, let me care for myself right this second and understand what's going on. Let me see why I can care for my immediate staff. See what like it took, it, it made a lot of people I know stop and take stock because this industry is not easy. And a lot of the time it's not forgiving on your head, on your body, on your ears, a lot of it. You're in front of the computer half the time, and then you're in a high energy situation a lot of the time when it's live music and everything. And that's something that we do it for, but it also is taxing on a lot of different parts of like the personal psyche. So silver lining is kind of like a taking account on what is and what isn't working for me um, within this. And I'll approach it differently if and when it does launch again um from a venue standpoint silver lining with pivoting into a more virtual it, it's allowed a lot of um different little niches to become more familiar when i couldn't speak the language of a lot of the um you know web curation and promotion and such like i'm a lot more familiar with that now i can 
operate a lot of different um, software that I couldn't before. I could v like visual jockey, VJ a show if I needed to. Um, I am much more comfortable on a on a mixing board. Um, I'm not sure if that pans, but like I've just kind of and a lot of my crew who've been well, which is small, but we've kind of just dove in and kind of taken the reins in that like way. So there are silver linings, but that is definitely a privilege that I have. I, I have the benefit of, you know, having a private concert essentially twice a week when I have these people come in. So that's something that I've taken away from it personally and the ways in which it's afforded me time and our crew time to, um, formulate ways in which we can execute everything kind of more meaningfully and with like a, uh, with more of a, a mind frame of what really is important and touching on what um, Gerald had spoken about with all the um, <clears throat> social issues that are going on, just allowing me pause to think on, hey, you know, what is important? What is being represented in my staff and bookings? And everything, how can I be more inclusive? How can I listen better? How can I use my platform in a way that represents exactly what's going on outside here? Um, and I think it's kind of, yeah, it's been a very necessary hard pause. Um, Mm -hmm. pause, I hope. It's, it's good to do it's good to take a breath and do a values check for sure and there's a lot of a lot of people doing that um hal i think you raised your hand yeah I, i'll just pile on a little um when world cafe live became a nonprofit after a couple of years of working on that conversion it's because we've always been mission driven and, and we combine with our education partner formerly live connections now now all under one umbrella and so we were coming up on a big transition anyway. So I agree with Meg. Um, I think this accelerated our transition from a, you know, from a, from a theoretically for-profit venue into a nonprofit arts organization where social impact uh, always was important to us, but now it's all about where artistry meets social impact. And, um, it's challenged us to continue our educational efforts, but I'm very proud of our team because we've done so. Um, we continue to work with students. We continue to work with mothers and babies on our lullaby project. Um, and and that's, that's been a life raft for all of us because we're also bogged down in all, all the things it takes to keep things going. But every now and then a little glimmer of music makes a big difference. You know? it does. We're like, wow, <laughs> oh yeah, that's why we do this. That's yeah. why we do um, <laughs> So, you know, I think it is a silver lining. It makes us all appreciate you know what we took for granted and like mike said you work so hard you never come up for air i don't see this as a time when most of us has come up have come up for air but it sure has been a bucket of ice dumped over <laughs> brad do you want to add anything to that too i, I was going to say i'm coming to meg's place because she's got private concerts um <laughs> if if you're open to it i would love to join <laughs> Um, know. <laughs> I think I know we're talking silver lining. I feel like the question had something to do with hybrid events. Is that right? Or no? Yeah, we're, not yes. looking, we're looking to see yeah. like what, what are some things that yeah. we might continue uh, with moving be able forward. to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my only comment would be, and we are we have attempted it in other markets. Um, the biggest challenges are, especially in comedy and some for music as well. We've seen it really successful for those individuals, but then you kind of burn every market. So it's a it's a good it's a good opportunity for artists to kind of pay their rent, um, but uh, long term it doesn't seem to be a, um, a rational play. So to Beth, I think there will be moments that you will be able to see an event from home. Um, it definitely has a, a very different feeling because I would like to s stand with all of you, seeing Medeski, Martin, and Wood in the middle of whatever, right, uh, and drinking whatever our cocktail choices. Um, so it, we've seen it, we've tried it. Um, the other side of it is has to do with agents and managers and, um, our, we've talked a little bit about this, but the economics of our business, they are razor sharp, uh, margins. You know, uh, some of our artists could walk with the entire ticketed door. Um, there are many reasons for that, but also our, our larger competitors have, have kind of caused that. And, um, 
to offer up, to put all the work in to hybrid model and put that online and all the equipment. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak for every uh, agent and manager, but I know that their artists would prefer that a significant portion of that revenue come in um, to their pockets as well, which is fair, but um, sometimes it doesn't economically work. Um, so I think, I think we'll see a little bit of it, but um, from a long-term perspective, I'm not sure how viable it is. So I hope that answers your question, Beth. Uh, really nice question. Yeah, and um, Gerald, you wanted to throw in there as well. Yeah, really quickly, uh, I would say one of the silver not lines that's becoming apparent from this meeting is that I think all of us now have this invitation to think more about community. That everyone is figuring out a way when you can't meet the bottom line to meet another kind of social bottom line. And I think that's been really remarkable to see. I'll say on behalf of the, uh, the owners of South Jazz Club, one of the first things they did when they couldn't open was they realized that they had all this, um, this uh, expertise in food preparation that no one was able to take advantage of. So they started serving, um, you know, our first, our, our healthcare professionals in hospitals who were working those double shifts. And so I think that's an example on that level of how everyone is figuring out how to use their six, foot of, six feet of influence and even broadening that away from just looking at their, you know, another night to fill in their venue. And that is to me a huge silver lining that I see, that community uh, vision. Right. Well said, Gerald, well said. Yeah. We, we have about um, two, two, three minutes left. I'm gonna do a little bit of a lightning round here for you guys and put you on the spot. So um, you are placed in front of a, a legislator who is positioned to make a yes, no vote on one of the um, bills that Howe has been working with, you know, at the, at the national level, or maybe it's a local city council person who doesn't quite understand exactly what the situation is right now. Um, you know, if you have 30 seconds to give them a pitch, what is that pitch so that people who are listening can kind of internalize that and that they can maybe be your voice if they're the ones who are in front of someone because this is a community. So if you're on the call right now, um, I know that all of these folks would love for you to check out the links that we put in the chat um, about the Save Our Stages campaign. So Hal, I know you are the most practiced at this, I think at this point. So I'm gonna go uh, with you first. You've got 30 seconds in front of whomever it is what, what do you need them to know? World-class cities need innovators. Innovators need creativity. Music is fundamental. Music and comedy and live performance to that. If you don't save that, you will not have a world-class city. Great. Brad? I, I think Hal said it. Culture, culture, culture. It, it, it creates jobs. It keeps jobs, keeps people happy. Um, yeah, couldn't have said it better, Hal. Really well said. Meg? It's, um, you know, the creative expression is therapy. People need a place to express themselves and to feel like they have somewhere to decompress and unwind. And that goes from staff to artists to the people who put things on. It's necessary and you can see that it's weighing on people. And it's an important, it's mental health, you know, it's, it's necessary. So that should be taken very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Gerald. Yeah, the folks that, who would come into your office as a legislator to ask for support, it's not merely so that their venues can continue as viable businesses, but so that the people who depend on it, as these folks have said, they rely on it emotionally, culturally, but these are ordinary folks who need to make a living. And this industry has a lot of people who pay taxes mm -hmm. and who contribute. They're our next door neighbors. And so this is not something that's way over there. This is something that's right in your community. Mm -hmm. So it's so, so, super important to support. Yeah, so people, people, culture, community, and all of that wrapping into Philadelphia being a world-class city when we are able to 
um, all be together again and, and share stages and drinks and laughs with one another. So thank you all for being part of this panel. Um, I'll give you a round of applause even though the audience can't do that. Um, you all have been great. Thank you for sharing your insight. And I hope, um, I hope to talk with all of you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Nice to talk to everyone. Bye-bye.